Michael, just moments ago, I was in a different location, sitting down with the mother of Natalie Holloway, Beth Holloway. It was a long day for her. She was understandably tired, but she took time for Court TV, who has been all over this story again from day one, 18 years ago. Now, I want to play what she told me in this interview. When we do play it, I want to note it's going to be a little hard to hear me, but you will be able to hear Beth Holloway loud and clear. Let's watch. No, I feel pretty victorious right now. I feel like we've accomplished something that we set out for 18 years ago. So it's a huge weight is lifted. So it feels great. What was it like to be face to face today with the man who murdered your daughter? Uh, I've been face to face with him before. So that was in 2005, uh, May 30th, early morning hours, 4 a.m. Been face to face with him in his prison and and Lima, Castro, Castro. So it was not unusual um, for me to have that desire to want to be face to face with him. I always have. And I think sometimes victims, uh, families do want to get to do get to their loved ones perpetrators. So it, it felt very powerful. What was his reaction when you stopped and looked him in the eye? Didn't seem to it doesn't seem to change. Yeah, his reaction doesn't seem to change. I don't think there are very many pressure points that Iran has. I think there are very few. So it, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to get a reaction out of him. Do you see anything in him? No. No. Mm -mm. How would you describe Iran Vandersloot? Oh, I would, I'd describe him as he has four functions of existence. And the only ones that he's shown me are the anger. He has that killer and food and sex and I really don't see any other real features of his existence so to make him up what did you make of his statement in court today his apology to your family oh since I know the manner and how he bludgeoned uh, Natalie to death and how he bludgeoned Stephanie to death and the things that he did after the fact it is an empty shell of an apology because no, no human, no person can do that. Um, it's not only the act of the killing, but it's knowing what he did after as well. And that shows that he has no conscience, no remorse, no guilt. So, Tell me about, about that confession. What was it like to hear it for the first time? It, it's almost as if you have to... Uh, it's just an impact into your soul that just blisters it and you can feel it when it begins to hit you and you begin to hear these words and and then you're you're witnessing it real time and you're sitting there watching it with federal agents and the US attorney the, the prosecutor and you're you're uh, wow it becomes uh, so real and um, it it but still even as shocking and and painful it is, as it is to hear him say that, it was still more torturous for me than not knowing. And I can say that now because I went for 18 years with not knowing to now knowing I see the difference. And as hard and painful as it was, it's better than the last 18 years because it's over now. Her murder has been solved. He's Neuron Vandersloat is no longer the suspect in Natalie's disappearance. Yaron Vandersloat is the murderer. He's the murderer. He's the killer of Natalie. So that is now giving me that never-ending nightmare being over. What was the most painful part for you to hear of his confession? Uh, it was painful, yet it made me proud, was I think, to hear how Natalie fought. I think that Wow, I was like, you know, damn, you know, she stood her ground, she fought, she stood up for what was right and knew what she wanted her life destiny to be. So I was like, I mean, as hard as that, I mean, I hate to say, but I mean, that was, you know, hard to hear, yet I was, I was like, you know, that's very strong. Yeah. Was what he said sort of what you expected? No. You know, what was surprising? Uh, I think the things that he did, I think the things that he does after he bludgeons his victims are 
are what are a bit shocking to me. I don't, that just shows he's, he's really a killer. The pornography. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, you know, that's what I'm saying. He only does things that satisfy himself. Were you able to listen in the same room during the proffer or watch in another room? Tell us about how that went down. Well, I, you know, I was able to be there and be a part of that, and I'm very appreciative of that. So I, I was there real time, and I was. I don't want to go into the details, but you know, it was. I was very fortunate because I was able to hear it real time, and it's, you know, it's, it's different when you get it after the fact, when you get it transferred to you, because then you're still going to think, well, there was one little scintilla of an answer or a question that maybe you wanted more information on. But I was able to witness everything in its entirety from, you know, I was able to even meet with a polygrapher that did this comprehensive and conclusion. And it was just like a person, it wasn't just like a person comes in, gives a polygraph test. I mean, you know, this was a team. This is a well-seasoned veteran team. Could you see it or just hear it? No, I did not. I did not see that. But I was able to meet with the polygrapher that was out of Miami, and so, and I felt good about the. I mean, you know, the federal agents that are involved. We got the, you know, the prosecutor there, and so it was a it was a very comprehensive team approach. Do you believe all of his story? I do. Why? Yes. Why? Yes, I believe it. Why yes. do you believe that now he's still in Because I was able to witness all of this and all the corroborated information, the conclusive and comprehensive testing, and even the comprehensive evaluation that led up to the actual test. So it wasn't just a one-shot deal. This was a this was a comprehensive investigation or evaluation of everything. So it all led to one answer that he was telling the truth. People want to know, did you did you need to hear these details? Was that something that you were uh, Yeah, it's not that you want to hear it, but I think that families that are, you know, have a, a loved one that has been a victim, they they want to know what happened. I mean, they want to even how no matter how painful it is, they want to hear what the perpetrator did, what happened to their loved one. They, they need to know so they can begin to put this to rest. You said that, or maybe the prosecutor said, they consulted your family for this plea. Are you pleased with all of the agreements that were reached today? Yes, 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 very much. It was a, it was a huge team effort, yes. As I said, I was sitting in the courtroom watching you today. Where do you get your strength? Well, I think I get my strength from people that have surrounded and supported me through this. I mean, Greta Van Susteren has been with me from day one. Then, as I've already mentioned, all of the federal agents from FBI in Miami, FBI in Birmingham. We have the prosecutor, the U.S. Attorney's Office. So you think of all these, and I believe people out, but all these teams of people. And I think of the Peru side. Then I've got, you know, Patriot Strategies, George Seymour, and his business associate Mark, and Dina Bellarte, the president of Peru. So I'm so, I draw, withdraw, you know, my strength from all of the support to make this happen. I mean, because everybody in that, that I've mentioned and people I know I've left out, you know, were a part of this today. So it's, it's not like it just happened today. This has been a long time coming, a long time. I was going to, that's my next question. This has been a long process. As you said, can you give us a sense of what it took to reach this point today, getting him here to the United States and this plea? Well, maybe a start was talking to Greta Van Susteren every morning at 4.30 a.m. my time. It was 5.30 hers Eastern, Eastern time every morning for nine months solid. Working it, working it, working it. I cannot tell you. I mean, it's been... A lot. That that is two years and seven months of just pound, pound, pound. Disappointment, setbacks, movement. Disappointment, setbacks, movement. It has been. It's been tough. It's been tough. What motivated you to overcome obstacle after obstacle? I remember watching you 18 years ago. I was glued oh. to the TV screen, of course. Yeah. Same thing. I don't know. I felt like we were always so close to it. We were. I felt like we would always get so close to the answer, and then bam, it was gone. So I felt like it was kind of a, a 
it was kind of a false, it was always a false start, you know, but that, that gives you, those false starts eventually you think are going to finally start, and it did, but it just took 18 years. What do you miss most about Natalie? Mm, what do I miss most about Natalie? I just, I think right now what I miss most about her is she would be married, she would be a doctor by now, I have no doubt, she would have children, Matt would have nieces and nephews, she would have nieces and nephews, my son has a, a daughter and a son. And I miss just her, you know, being able to experience that. And I miss being a grandmother to her children. And I think that what I appreciate, though, now, since I no longer have Nellie, is I see her through Matt's life now. And I see her through my grandchildren's life. And so I think that's where the focus needs to be now. You said this is over. Is it over? It's over. The never-ending nightmare is over, and for me, it's better than closure. And everybody has their own words that they use, but that is mine. Over, to me, is better than closure. That's my nightmare, and it was a never-ending nightmare. I was never going to get out of the weeds. I was never going to get out of the rabbit holes. But it's over now. It's done. Yeah. You mentioned that. Your son. Uh-huh. How's he doing? He's great. He's you know, I think, and I think, and somehow Natalie, as I said, moving through him as well, he's become, he's an airline pilot. He's looking good, standing strong. He's even doing some interviews. He's never. So he has, yeah, stood right by me at the press conference. I felt pretty strong, you know, sat right there by the, uh, you know, court this morning, victim's impact statement. So, yeah, it's good. In Natalie's story... And Michael, she mentioned her son, Matt. I want to mention that I was able to also meet him and interview him this afternoon. He had some compelling things to say. We're going to play his interview later on Court TV. But essentially, he says he still doesn't believe Yaron Vandersloot is completely telling the truth. Everything that happened inside this courthouse behind me, in the opinion of Matt Holloway, was self-serving to Yaron Vandersloot. And get this, he also says that Yaron made a mistake, that he agreed to get out in 22 years, and guess who's going to be in Peru when he's released? Wow, and I, and I don't doubt it. And, and I, I, I can't say I do disagree with him about him telling the whole truth. But what I want now, you were in the courtroom when this whole thing went down. I want you to give us a sense of what it was like in there. As he, I understood he turned to the family to apologize. Tell us about his elocution in court. He did. From the very start, when he entered the courtroom 10 minutes before the hearing was actually set to begin, Michael, he enters with his shoulders back, his chest out, his chin up, confident, smiling at his attorney, shaking their hands, greeting his team, towering above them. He's a big guy. And would answer the judge during all the qualities, um, qualities, excuse me, confidently. Yes, ma'am. I do, ma'am. And when it came time for him to make a statement, he stood. I, he didn't have any paper in front of him. It was it was off, you know, from the top of his head, I guess. He apologized to the Holloway family. He turned towards them at that point. Beth tells me that he did so. Matt tells me that he did turn towards them. They think it's a hollow apology. He also apologized to his own family and said that he was a changed person. He's not the person that he was 18 years ago, that while incarcerated, that he's found Jesus Christ. In that moment, his voice slightly uh, dipped a bit. I couldn't hear because the people around me, I'm surrounded by the friends and family of Natalie Holloway, were rumbling and reacting to he's not the same person and his apology, rolling their eyes at each other. Chanley, I have to ask, because as I look at this deal, I wonder about the price paid for the information. And, and the part of it that I have a concern about is that I guess he's going to do about 22 more years, and then he'll be a free man. He will be under the auspices of the court. Again, he'll be under a court supervision for three years. But he's only going to be about 58, a fairly young man. Was there any concern on the part of Beth or even Matt Holloway about the fact that he's getting out at a relatively young age? I asked Beth that if she was okay with those terms. She's completely okay with it, is what she told me. Now, Matt, on the other hand, is not so much. That everything today happened to uh, serve Euron's own interest. There's a reason he wants to go back to Peru. He has more freedom in that prison there. He was able to get married, to have a kid, to, to run a drug ring uh, with the cartel there. And like Matt said, 
Huron did make a mistake. He told me, we'll play this interview later, that uh, when he is released 22 years from now, Matt plans to be there in Peru. Right. So. One final question, Shanley, then I'll let you go on your way. Um, what's next now for Huron Vandersloot? According to the federal judge inside this courthouse, which I know I haven't talked a lot about her, fantastic judge today did an, the whole court administrators did an excellent job today. It was an efficient hearing. She indicated that he is to be extradited out of here back to Peru ASAP. He could already be on his way, Michael. But now that this is all sealed, it's signed, it's filed. They want him out of here. The Holloway family wants him out of here as well. All right, Chandler. And Painter. I do mention. Yes. Uh, he, he, sorry, just he can't appeal this. This is this is like Beth said in my interview. It is over. He can't appeal any decision here, and anything he confessed to, the U.S. can't use against him, Michael. Yeah, and that reminds me. One last question here. What about Aruba? Mm -hmm. Can they go after yeah. him in this case? Well, we, based on our research, know that the statute of limitations for murder in Aruba has run. It was 12 years for that country. I've been hearing rumblings of other ways a country can get around it with the cooperation of the U.S. However, Beth indicated me to me just moments ago that she's okay with this being done and through. And whatever Aruba wants to do is Aruba, she says. She's not going to have any part of it. All right, Chanley Painter, thank you so much for that report. Just wonderful, wonderful work today. Truly appreciate it. Once again, you're on Vandersloot today. Remarkable um, events in that Birmingham, Alabama federal courtroom, apologizing to the family and admitting and giving details about how he killed Natalie Holloway, a case that's really defined many of us who are into true crime, has defined true crime for 18 years. Well, now we have a conclusion. And the best part of all, is that Beth Holloway, the mother of that young girl there you're looking at, Natalie Holloway, is okay with it. And she says to have it over is better than closure. So we have to go with that. All right.